Hello, everybody. Happy Monday. I hope that you have had a fantastic weekend. Man, has the weather not been awesome. I know that I have been enjoying the weather. My family and I have been trying to get outside as much as possible and just soaking up the sun and the cool breeze. And I hope that you guys have been doing the same. Well, Welcome to today's online mini reading lesson with moi, Miss Whiting. Yes. Um, today, as you can see behind me, we are continuing with argumentative text. So I have a uh, quick little review. Make sure that you're you're uh, tracking with me and a sample story that I want to read. Um, hopefully we can do it together. Um, then I'm going to introduce the story of the week and the vocabulary that goes along with it, okay? All right, let's go ahead and get started. So our teak that we will be using is the same teak that we have been talking about for the past, I guess now, this is like I said, our third week. It is 5.9 E I and I I and I I I. So it says, recognize characteristics and structures of argumentative text by I, identifying the claim, I, I, explaining how the author has used facts for or against an argument, and I, 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 identifying the intended audience or reader. So those are the three main things that we want to be uh, looking for. You want to recognize them in the text that we read and have those really be like the key points that we look at to identify whether it's an argumentative text or not. So let's go ahead and dig into that a little bit deeper uh, today. So I'm hoping that by today that you, you're going to uh, recognize these terms that I'm telling you and, and hopefully you're able to tell me what they mean yourselves. Well, the purpose of argumentative text, like we've mentioned before, is simply to persuade or convince the reader to think or act in a certain way. So specific that specific way that the author is wanting you to um, believe or think or act or whatever. Um, that is the main purpose for argumentative text. So the author is writing it to convince you of something. So the last uh, example that I read, I believe that he was trying to convince you that basketball was better than baseball, right? And if you recall, two weeks ago, I read the story about um, the, the student that was wanting to convince the reader that no homework is better, right, than all the homework that they might have. So today, we are going to read a story about a new bedtime, but I'll get to that in a minute. Um, so what I'll also be looking for is the claim. And remember, the claim is just the author's opinion about that topic. So in the homework article, um, his uh, claim was that they should get rid of homework. School should not have homework, right? Um, and uh, each claim comes with certain reasons and evidence that supports that. So the reasons would just be, um, you know, we went over a few with the basketball uh, game last week. We said that, or the author said that, you know, in basketball, there because there's fewer players, you're going to get more play time. Um, the game doesn't last as long, so um, you're able to do other things. Um, and I think there was another reason that he gave as well, right? So all of your reasons kind of go and support that claim. It's basically the why you believe what you believe. Um, and then to make it a nice, strong argument, a nice, strong claim, is you have to have that evidence to back it up. So with the basketball guy, he he's played both sports before. Um, he's talked to other uh, other players, other students. He's done some research, right? So he's got some either facts or detailed examples, um, all those things down there that support his reasons and his claim, ultimately, right? Um, so that is what we are going to do this week as well. So your story is an argument to text, and I'll get that into that in a little bit. But I want to show you one example first, okay? This one is called New Bedtime. So I'm going to go ahead and transition. New Bedtime. Now, I don't know if you guys have a bedtime that's um, early or late, but let's see what these guys um, have. Well, apparently, we are talking about a bedtime for a seventh grader. So I'm going to read this out loud. You can read along with me, and I'm going to stop along the way to pick out the claim, pick out the 
um, reasons and some of that text evidence, okay? New bedtime. Eight o'clock, it's too early for a seventh grader to go to bed, especially an active seventh grader like me. Sleep is important, but I am getting more than I need, and I think I should be allowed to stay up until nine o'clock. All right. Did you get it? Did you catch it? What his claim is in just that very first paragraph? Remember, there's it's almost always right at the very, very beginning, right? They state their claim, their, they, their argument. What are they trying to convince somebody of? I think you got it, right? They say that they should be allowed to stay up until 9 o'clock. Until 9 o'clock. So I have a feeling that they're going to get into some reasons why they should stay up until 9 o'clock. So here we go. Let's see if we can uh, distinguish or find out those, uh, those reasons. It says, when I get home from school, I barely have time to finish homework before I'm off to soccer practice every day. After practice, I come home, shovel food in my mouth, take a quick shower. That barely gets all the dirt off me. Then I have to jump right into bed to be in bed by 8 o'clock. I have no downtime. The Cleveland Clinic reports that children need downtime to reset their brains and prepare for new activities. Staying up for an extra hour would give me just that. Okay, so... What is his first reason that he should be uh, allowed to stay up until nine o'clock? Did you catch it? I think I caught it here. Let's let me grab a different color pen. It says here that children need downtime to reset their brains and prepare for new activities. Staying up an extra hour would give him that. So right there, they children need downtime to reset their brains and prepare for new activities, you know, staying up the extra hour. You can kind of put all that as his first reason. And did he get this from a credible source? He did. Look, it says that he got his evidence from the Cleveland, Cleveland Clinic, the Cleveland Clinic. And so I would imagine that is credible because that is a medical uh, center. Right, and we would imagine that they have done their proper research. So here's his reason number one. Uh, that goes a line that supports his claim that he should be allowed to stay up until nine o'clock. And then let's look at this next paragraph. It says, the Sleep Foundation recommends that children my age get about nine hours of sleep. I wake up for school at seven o'clock. So that means I'm currently getting 11 hours of sleep. If I go to bed at nine o'clock, I'll still be getting over the recommended number hours of sleep. All right, did you catch it? There's the second one. If he goes to bed at nine o'clock, he'll still be getting over the recommended number hours of sleep. And did he give us some credible information here? Some credible sources? Now he's, uh, quoting or giving us information from the Sleep Foundation, saying that they recommend nine hours of sleep, and he's saying, hey, if I get to bed at nine, I'll still be getting the recommended number of hours of sleep. So there's his second reason and a good credible source that he's getting it from. Let's keep going. Um, it says, I surveyed 100 of his classmates, and 92% of them go to bed at nine o'clock or later. The other 8% go to bed at 8.30. It is extremely rare for kids my age to go to bed at 8 o'clock. Did you catch it? There it is. It is extremely rare for kids my age to go to bed at 8 o'clock. Now, in my opinion, this is maybe not the most, the strongest reason, I think, <laughs> but it is a reason that he's using. And um, he is he is using some supporting evidence in the form of what? A survey. It says he surveyed 100 of his classmates. So not, he's not just, you know, shooting this stuff out, you know, taking it out from nowhere. He's actually going in and um, getting some factual information to prove his point. So there are his three reasons. Now remember, as we read, there's usually some sort of a counter claim, right? Counter meaning opposite or against. And so let's see if there's that. And then of course we wanna find out who our audience is this intended for, this who this piece is intended for. That would be our audience, right? 
So here we go. It says, your argument is that children need sleep to recharge and be successful. I agree. However, I am getting more sleep than I really need. One extra hour being awake will be more beneficial to me than an extra hour of sleep. Okay, let me see if I can uh, highlight that little piece there. I'm going to use this dry erase marker to underline our counter claim because and I know it's counter because it's saying your argument is that children need to uh, need sleep to recharge and be successful and and technically he's saying yeah I, I agree with you but but however I am getting more sleep than I really need so he's saying yes I agree but I'm already getting enough sleep even more than what's, what's recommended um, and he's going on to, to kind of push one more little deal and say one extra hour of being awake will be more beneficial to me than an extra hour of sleep. So he's really trying to hammer it in, right? Um, and then here, that last paragraph, it says, it's, it is unreasonable to continue to make me to go to bed at eight o'clock. Giving me an extra hour will give me time to unwind. And I will still be getting more than the recommended amount of sleep for a 12 year old. Um, I should be able to stay up until nine o'clock on school nights for the rest of the school year. Okay, um, audience, who is this piece written for? Who can actually uh, give him permission to go to sleep a little bit later than what he has been? Yes, his parents. So is it directly stated in here? Is he saying, mom and dad, eight o'clock is too early. No, he's not. We're having to infer, right? We're taking what we have read in the text with what we already know about being kids, right? We're putting those together and saying, yes, it's his parents that he's wanting to, he's reaching out to his parent, his parents um, are the audience. Okay, so audience, parents, the parents, his parents. Okay, well, there you go. There's one little, another little example article that I hope um, is helping to solidify the idea of what an argumentative text includes, okay? Um, so by now, I've showed you three short stories and have talked through all of the different pieces uh, and elements of argumentative text. You have read two stories on your own, Let Wild Animals Be Wild and Don't Release Wild Animals into the wild, or don't release all the animals back into the wild. And today you're going to read a third one. So man, I think you're gonna be ready. If you're really thinking through and reading these stories and looking at your anchor chart um, and trying to put all these things together, then you are getting a great understanding of argument of the text. If you are not and you're struggling to identify the claim and the reasons in these stories, please reach out to your teacher and we will try to talk you through that, okay? All right, so I want to point out one thing this week. We are working out of our big one today, this week and actually for the rest of the year, okay? So we were having you guys do your stories out of our first edition, our 5.2, or excuse me, 5.1 book. All right, and I always, I showed it to you sideways um, this way because it is a much thinner book than book two, right? So we've been working out of 5.1. Now we are having you work out of 5.2, okay? So um, if you have your textbook, and hopefully a lot of you will be having your textbook since we are um, having everyone come up to grab all of their textbooks from the room, from your classrooms. Um, but we are going to be looking at this story right here. And let me go ahead and transfer over. It is on page 575. People should manage nature. And let me see if I can zoom out just a wee bit. I'll go ahead and tell you the page numbers you are to read today. We're doing it a little bit different this week. This is quite a lengthy story, okay? It has quite a few pages. Um, quite a few, a lot more than what we um, normally assign. So we have broken it up into three days today, of course, or this week. Of course, if you want to read it all in one sending, you absolutely can, and you can get ahead. Um, but just so you know that today, your assignment, normally we have a vocabulary assignment 
uh, today I just want you to read pages um, 575 through 579. So that would be this page here, 575, 577, 578, and 579. Okay, so that would be the pages that you will read today. But before um, you guys get started, I do want to introduce our five vocabulary words. Here we go. Okay, so here's the vocabulary for people should manage nature. Our first word is geological. This is an adjective, and it's a long word. How many syllables? G-O-L-O-G-I-C-O. G-O-L-O-G-I-C-O. So five syllables. Um, and you can see there the pronunciation key. Um, and the definition is relating to the study of Earth's physical properties. And the sentence I have added is, this is a geological map of the United States. So as you can see, well, I hope you can tell that this is a map of the United States. It looks a little different than probably what you're used to. But all of these different colors and all of these uh, different kind of shapes uh, that the colors are making represent different geological features um, uh, in the United States. So in the story you'll be reading about some geological features um, that will be pertaining to if people should manage nature or not. Our next word is one that I think everybody knows, right? We know what a habitat is, a place where a plant or an animal normally lives or grows. I know you guys know what a habitat is as before we left for spring break, you guys were doing your ecosystem projects. Um, in order for you to know what an ecosystem is, you have to know what a habitat is. So it's a noun, right? Have, it, tat, three syllables. Um, and the sentence that I came up with is, these polar bears live in a cold and icy habitat. So we'll be seeing how that plays into our story this week. Um, the next word, I'm not sure if you know, it's an interesting word is actually um, stemmed in French and it has a silent letter at the end. So the word is pronounced debris, debris. So two syllables, debris. It is a noun and it basically is just the remains of something that has been destroyed. So um, look at all the debris that washed up on the shore. Um, or you might say, um, there was a lot of debris left on the floor after our journal project. <laughs> so maybe scraps of paper um, um, or something like that. Um, so we will be mentioning and talking about debris in our story this week. Our next word is advocates, advocates, advocates. Um, it's a noun and it's a plural noun in this case. And an advocate is someone who supports a cause or policy. So along with um, that picture of the debris, um, I said, who will be the advocates for this beach area? Meaning who is gonna support the cleanup of this beach? Who's gonna support keeping this area um, nice and um, the way it's, it was intended to be, okay? So we're going to see who the advocates are for um, the land that we talk about in this story. And then our last word is valve, valve. And I think some of you guys know what a valve is. Valve, it's just one syllable. It is a noun and it is a structure that controls the flow of materials. And so my question to you, are these valves on or off? <laughs> I'm pretty sure they're off because the little black knob there is not pointing to the on um, or it could be in the middle somewhere. Um, I actually am not 100% sure on that one, but um, it is a Y valve, which is what they're going to be talking about in the story. All right. So those are our five words for our story this week. Like I mentioned earlier, you're just reading pages 575 through 579, okay? We're not having you do a vocabulary activity um, this week since our story is extra long, but I do want to, um, to do one thing after you're done reading your first few pages, okay? I want you to share with a family member a connection that you made um, 
as part of today's reading. So once you've read pages 575 through 579, think of a connection that um, comes to mind, right? And we can make, it could be a text to text, maybe a connection to the story you read last week or the week before, or maybe a connection, a text to self connection, just something from your own that happened um, to, yourself, to yourself in the past sometime. Or it could be a text to world, right? Something that you uh, read about in the news, on TV, on TikTok, I don't know. Something that's not about you, um, but that you can relate these uh, first few pages to. And I think you probably can make a couple of connections, um, especially considering what we um, were studying before we left for spring break in science, okay? All right, you guys, um, if you have any questions about today's assignment or argument of text, please feel free to reach out to your teachers. Um, we are so happy to help. We really are. We love hearing from you. We love uh, talking to you, interacting with you online um, and all of that. So anyway, that's it for me for today. I hope you guys, you guys have a great day and we will see you tomorrow. Bye.